Internet, hello you lovelies and welcome to my Alien Romulus spoiler review, my most requested video for a spoiler review to date, and I so appreciate it, I'm making this because of you guys, because usually these spoiler reviews don't do well, and usually it's kind of redundant to make a secondary review. So as such, since I've got a ton of videos to film this week, this video might be a little less edited, so I do hope you enjoy it for everyone, and I mean everyone that asks. If you're new to this page, and maybe you found this page because of Alien, I do movie reviews and movie news, as well as comic book reviews and comic news, so if you like movies or comics or comic book movies or anything in the genre space, please do subscribe to this page. I'm trying to grow it to 40k. I'm trying specifically to hit 36k by my 36th birthday, which is in a month on September 15th. So let's keep growing this beast out. Much love to all you are here. So Alien Romulus is a movie that is so divisive that I thought when I left the theater, it was going to be like, yeah, that was great. I love that. I've been waiting for an alien movie like that. And then I'm glad I saw it a little early because by the time it came out, now it is so weirdly divisive, people are retroactively saying they love Alien Covenant and Prometheus, two movies that have like a three on Letterboxd, these movies that have been panned for years, these movies that have been the reason this needed a reboot. Now, there is absolutely a conversation to be had about nostalgia. There's a conversation to be had about art evolving and the perception of art over time. There's also a conversation to be had about people remembering their experience with the film versus the film itself. And I think that's happening a lot in comic book movies, where Fantastic Four, the OG trilogy, I love a lot of the ingredients in that pie, but man, the pie itself, not so great. And now people are saying, oh, I love the Fantastic Four. There's an experience to be had with a movie that you can love an experience and the movie still not work. And art is subjective. I will never, ever tell someone they're wrong. In fact, with this movie, I loved it and people got mad at me for loving it and then other people are like, oh, sorry, it's not blah, blah, blah. No, no, I'm sorry. I had a better two hours of my life than you. It's an experience. So my experience was extremely positive and I want to talk about my experience with it. So this is going to be a bit more stream of consciousness than maybe reviews uh, that other people do. But the film opens with a very tense, taut, agonizing, brutal experience of what it's like to live in this world. And because of that experience, it's very slow paced and it's very methodical and it's very rich in world building like Alien the first film, which is all about setting and being methodical and having very enchanting world building. The first Alien film is like a movie about a setting as much as it's about the Xenomorphs. The actual set, which we go back to in this film, is the movie. And I don't understand, I know there's a lack of attention span issue because TikTok and YouTube and I'm part of the problem, I'm making stuff as short form as I can to get people to watch, but it is a problem that we are having less and less attention, so we are therefore finding things that are methodically placed, methodically paced to be boring. And I thought the movie worked because it transitioned from horror and methodical into action in a way that reflected both the first Alien and then into Aliens. And a lot of people loved that opening, and then as soon as it went into high gear, I've read things about people not liking the action. This movie is one of the best shot sci-fi horror films I've ever seen. It's one of the best shot films of the last 10 years. Like, this work from the DP is stunning. It is so well captured in its practical nature. The film is actually built. They made these things. And my biggest flaw is the film is a character we'll talk about in a moment that isn't practical because it throws off the rest of the film. This movie is so tangible the DP was actually able to shoot it. He was actually able to move the camera. He was actually able to set up frames in a way that felt like 70s, 80s, and 90s movies. There was a shift when CGI became so popular and then another shift when the volume became so popular that I don't find most DPs, uh, most DPs and I would say um, the DP from The Batman, I think his name is Greg Frazier, who also shot Dune, other than Greg Frazier, I don't find a lot of DPs can shoot on the volume and they tend to make things like boop, Whereas the Batman, using the volume, only enhanced the experience, but he was able to think how to shoot in his style around the volume instead of let the volume handicap him. This film was so practical, the DP got to play. They got to shoot the damn thing. And that's as we get into, it was obviously in the first bit, but as we get into the aliens, 
action and pacing, it really enhanced the experience because there were moments that fully felt like a video game level where you're given rules and then you're as the eye line of the character told to survive this setting. When the Xenomorphs, I'm so used to non-spoilers, I'm going to start talking about things in specifics. When the Xenomorphs and the facehuggers are moving and attacking it doesn't have to be from like, you know, the, the very harsh 180 rules kind of become the 90 degree rule. It, it feels like a corner. This movie was able to take some wild swings and I love that hallway sequence with all the face huggers where they had to worry about temperature, where they had to worry about all these things because the world building had gotten us to the point where I love the rules and how to survive in that setting and all those things. And the actors in this film, I want to give full credit. Like Kaylee Spenny is so good in this. What a genius final girl. And the big stealer of the entire movie for me is the guy that played... Uh, Andy David Johnson. Now, David Johnson in this movie is a guy that has like 2,000 followers on social media. This is an unknown actor, and he is absolutely captivating. He is another in the long line of, holy crap, the synthesoids in these films are such a scene stealer. Like, in my opinion, David Michael Fassbender is the best element of his, his films. I consider what Andy does in these films to be so captivating, so interesting. When people are mean to him, you hate the humans and love him. When he shifts... It gives you these visuals like the, the, the Waylon uh, imagery over his eyeballs, like as his eyes roll back. I love that the film had like demonic possession elements, but instead of being possessed by a demon, he was literally being possessed by a corporation. And a lot of people got mad at me for discussing economics and Reaganomics and politics. And the world is a world we have to live in. Art is going to reflect the world. Art is a bearing of a soul to discuss things. My interpretation is a discussion of trickle-down economics not working, of corporations not caring about their people, of this late-stage capitalism we're living in now. And there's a literal scene where, using the imagery, the language of possession, Andy is possessed, but instead of being possessed by a demon, he is possessed by a corporation. That is about as clear-cut as it gets when discussing what the messagery in the film is. The messaging of this film is so clearly... It's not good to believe in a corporation that will never have your best interests at heart, and profit is always going to win, and that is the world we live in, not this sci-fi world. It is our world, and I think it's an important message to try to digest. Now, while we're going in this journey, I'll, I'll nip it in the bud here. The thing I didn't like about this film is I hated that they used deepfakes, AI, a blend of CGI and animatronics to create a character that is a dead man. And my problems with literally reanimating a corpse are plenty. My problems with, I understand Ian Holmes' estate might have approved. It's ghoulish. Um, I don't know the situation. I don't care to ever know the situation. It is ghoulish to use that. The way it would have worked is to make an animatronic and honor him as an android. The character is animatronic perhaps make stan winston-esque animatronics i would rather it look bad because it's stilted than look bad because the uncanny valley of this ghoulish undead ian holm is staring at me now i have no problem with another actor voicing him i have no problem with even a lookalike playing him if and the, the estate did apparently clear all this if the estate signs off but the way it was portrayed just felt like an undead actor, and that felt off. So that that was a huge problem I had the film. I didn't love that. I did love the messaging in that character. I did love that, you know, an android is given a directive and he's living through it, and then, you know, Andy is given a directive. Like, the parallels of what black and white ones and zeros, yes, no thinking are absolutely work. I don't like how it was delivered. I think that that element bothered me. Now, the thing that bothered a lot of people was the third slash fourth act, because the film had a beautiful three-act structure, and then it kept going. I love that it kept going. I love that it pushed you past the point you thought you could handle. Personally, once they were off the ship, I was like, man, I'm exhausted. I have survived this experience. Now we're safely in our escape ship. Everything is fine. I want my little denouement, and then I'll leave happy, and I'm shocked this film's going to have a happy ending. Then there was another 20 minutes, and I loved that because I'd already been pushed to what I thought was my limit, and then I was so exhausted the fear was so much more palpable, just like the characters. We've lived with these characters. Our eye lines are likewise exhausted. So now that we've got these exhausted characters, it feels so much more believable to follow their desperate journey because you're desperate, you're exhausted. I love that. We've been pushed to a limit and we go further along with the characters that have been pushed to their limit and have to go further. Now, the big entity at the end, the offspring 
of Xenomorph and Human is something that, on paper, I would have thought I'd hate. I've hated the idea of Jurassic Park doing human-dinosaur hybrids. I've hated the idea of any time they try to make a sci-fi thing go that way. But Xenomorphs, there is a history. There's a precedent for this. And it does tie into the Prometheus legend. So I think it really worked what they did here. And the actual execution of it was genuinely some of the best Fede Alvarez-tinged horror I could have imagined. So you've got your horror in the opening. That is classic 70s horror. You've got your action in the center, which is 80s and 90s action. And then at the end, the button on the film, almost in a chronological storytelling way, is 2010s, 2020s, terrifying Fede Alvarez horror. And that was a real person they dressed and did makeup on instead of making it CGI. So even if on paper I didn't love the concept, and I wouldn't have, but then the way they landed it, I did, they cast an NBA all-star draft uh, hopeful from like four years ago. This guy named, I believe it's Rob Bob Krosky, Bob, it's B-O-B-R-O-C-Z-K-I. Very intense last name. Also, it means his name is Bob Bobrovsky, which is a bold swing from his parents. But this dude is like over seven feet tall, all limbs, went out for the NBA, and I love that they cast a person. They put someone in this. They actually let someone be a physical manifestation of this terror and obviously made him much scarier. But, like, what a cool role for a guy that that's tall. You don't get to play roles very often if you're that tall, I imagine. What a perfect opportunity for him as an actor, and he terrified me. I'll remember the imagery of the offspring the rest of my life. I'll remember the xenomorph-human hybrid thing that came out of this movie because of this performance. It felt so tangible and real, and I thought it was a really good animatronic because they built amazing animatronics for the xenomorphs. They've built amazing animatronics for facehuggers for years. I assumed this was the next advancement in technology. It was a dude. It was a person. It was an NBA hopeful. That's awesome. I love that. So for me, the fear and the the sheer shock and the intensity because of the duration of what I'd lived through, because of the other films I'd survived, so to speak, I loved this choice. And I genuinely will remember the imagery forever. And I love that they made it in a way that honored the old films, that was practical, that was the next evolution in this franchise. I'm even cool if going forward they tie things into Prometheus, they kind of make that mythology work. The idea of the Xenomorphs is this perfect killing machine. Humans see themselves as perfect. The idea of this offspring is so full of messages that can be turned into themes. It's so full of ideas of our own trying to escape mortality. I mean, the film that exists because of someone trying to escape mortality. Someone dying tries to live I would love to explore the immortality concepts that they do in this franchise already. I would love to discover our arrogance through the corporation versus through these entities of hybrid. I would love to look at these themes and messages that I think they're just beginning to address in a new way. So that actually worked for me against all odds. I didn't think it would. It was the wild swing I talked about in the non-spoiler review. And I've seen in the last few days an aggressive, um, I don't know, uh, hatred for fan service. Since movies have been pop culture, there have been references to other movies, even in-universe references to themselves. Like, the one that comes to mind right now is Maverick, referencing Lethal Weapon because it starred Danny Glover and Mel Gibson, directed by Dick Donner. So there was a moment where they, like, stopped and cheekily looked at each other and, like, made a this-is-familiar moment tying into Lethal Weapon. If that got made today, people would be like, oh, it's too meta, because so much is meta. But we're living in an age of meta. I'm looking at my phone right now talking to you. The internet makes it so we're all connected. TikTok and algorithms and all these things that cause parasocial relationships make it so I'm probably talking to you either on your TV or on your phone that's in your life and connecting to you. Fourth walls are made to be broken when we're living in an age where everything is so connected. So meta humor is a very logical thing in the age of this Orwellian big brother nonsense that we brought upon ourselves. We film ourselves all the time. We monitor ourselves. We share too much. That's so necessary to poke fun at. Satire is our way of acknowledging uh, horrors. And I do think that satirizing fourth walls and the meta humor we live in today is a way for us to cope. And I think that in movies that are this big and this important, you need these moments of like, hey, we know you're a fan and we love you too. Like, this is by fans for fans. Fede Alvarez is clearly a Ridley Scott fan, clearly a James Cameron fan, clearly a fan of this franchise. Why not have little fan moments? It's not like someone looked at the camera, and I get some of the lines of dialogue being repeated and quoted bothered some people. I think it's a stupid nitpick, and it's also like three minutes of the movie. Two minutes of the movie. If two minutes of a 120-minute 
if two minutes of a 120 minute film take you out of the film, then I'm sorry that it was never going to be for you. If you're looking for something to that level, if one 60th of the film is going to destroy your entire experience of the other 59 60ths, I can't help you. So for me personally, I got a lot out of the hybrid that I didn't expect. I got a lot of attention I didn't expect. I loved the face huggers. I loved the use of the x-ray technology for horror. I loved these characters not being all just like English, uh, you know, American or British accent. I liked that there was some culture that felt like it was, uh, you know, a planet with people that are trying to get by, trying to escape. They wouldn't all sound alike. So I really liked that the accents were so prevalent, strong, and the people were so, you know, different. Like, I like the disparate nature of their personalities and the diverse nature of their casting and the diverse nature of their opinions and voice. I liked all that for building a world, and I personally... Wish that we could celebrate films without putting down others. Because I, I got mad at someone being mad for a two-minute moment, but like I'm not going to think less of uh, you know their opinion on something else. So people getting mad that people like things is a weird problem I'd like to stop. It won't. Um, but it would be nice if we could just celebrate a movie. I mean, right now we're living in a xenomorph day. Like, right now we're talking about Alien again. We're talking about the prequels. I personally didn't love them as much as others did, but we're talking about them, and that's cool. Art, it's finding its footing. And people are finding their way into Alien. That's what these movies are for. That's what franchises are for. That's what legacy sequels are for. So if you watched Alien Romulus and found your way back to Alien from before you were born, or Aliens from before you were born, or Alien 3, maybe from before you were born, because it's older now than the watch R-rated movies and buy yourself a ticket legally age, awesome. It's working. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the spoiler review. I hope that uh, we can have a, a civil conversation in the comments below. And I hope that everyone that wanted this review got uh, what they wanted out of it. I'm going to try to start doing live streams probably once a month to start on this page. Um, but that'd be a cool way to like have a Q&A with you guys. So questions you had for me that were spoilery and, and those type of things. I think I'm going to try to implement that here. So much love. Please do like, subscribe, leave a comment, especially if you were one of the folks who wanted this spoiler review. I'm happy to have a conversation down below. Hoping as much worked for you as worked for me. And again, I really appreciate each and every one of you being, excuse me, being here. I, um, I've always done stuff for other channels and growing this one has been much more personal and much more um, personally satisfying than I expected. Every number up there in that subscriber count means so much to me because this is mine. So thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Hope you enjoyed the movie. Hope you enjoyed this review. I'll see you guys soon. Leave comments down below. Leave questions down below and I'll try to answer as many as I can. Much love. I'll see you guys soon.